Good morning. Our reading today is from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. And the heading is Encouragement to be Faithful. I thank God, whom I serve as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. Thank you for your word, Lord. God, today we ask you to hear our prayers. We ask for healing. In a day where we are so connected to the world, set us apart. In a time of great unrest and uncertainty, we ask for holiness. So search our hearts, renew our minds, and help us love like you love us. Make us holy. Use us to do your will on this earth. God, today we ask that you would restore us. Gather up the bits and pieces of our souls and mend them with your loving hand. Search out those parts that we try to hide from you. Today, God, we invite you in. Our faith is in Jesus Christ. We trust you. May we be set apart for you. May we be holy. Right. So, as I, as I said a little bit earlier, um, our focus is going to be a bit on prayer today. Um, and so, um, and one of the things I wanted to share, I've been kind of wanting to share for a while is Jono, is um, one of the key things um, that has really impacted him in the last year especially is, is the way um, prayer has revitalized the, the work that's, that's been going on in South Sudan. And so I thought I'd just might invite Jono up and just to share a little bit about that. It's all good. He's done a warm up now, so he, he was okay the first time through, so he should be good. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning everyone. Nice to see your beautiful smiles again this morning. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. You're so encouraging. All right, so yeah, Nick asked me to share this morning a little bit about our team and South Sudan's journey of prayer over the past year. So God started really laying on our team this scripture over and over again that's well known to all of you, 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. 
as God stirred us with the scripture, we started having monthly prayer meetings as a church. We already had um, daily prayer as a team to commit our activities to God. We had weekly um, leaders prayer to commit our activities to God. But these prayer meetings were about seeking the face of God. And we had longer periods of time where we could just wait on God, get on our knees and cry out to him. And at the same time, the pastor of our church, Mabior, unbeknown to us, we didn't find out to the end of the year, had started fasting. And he fasted, um, you know, regularly every week, but he also did one fast of 26 days. Not sure how he managed that. Uh, Desi and I also felt led to start fasting, but for us it was one day a week. Um, But that, even one day, was so hard for me, I'd say, that it's one of the hardest things that I've done. Um, But as we learned to do it, we saw amazing fruit in our life. I felt that spent that fasting really focused my attention onto God. It also created space in the day as times that we would have usually been eating meals, we're able to commit to prayer. And it also increased my passion for God as I realized that I loved God even more than food, which for me is saying a lot. (laughs) At the end of the year, our pastor, Mabior, invited our whole church to a three-day fast. And this finished with a Saturday prayer and worship gathering that was a really powerful time of people encountering God. As we shared a couple of months back in our interview with Brent, God really honored the obedience of our team to prayer. And we saw so much awesome fruit as a result. Our church tripled in size to over 700 people. While we were committing, the, while we had this time of commitment to prayer, we saw manifestations of the Holy Spirit that we hadn't seen before, with people on their knees weeping uncontrollably for their nation. We, people were having visions and hearing words from the Lord. We saw a growing hunger for God in the rural villages around Tonj, with many leaders coming to us and asking us to plant churches or start Che in their village. People who had been hardened to the gospel for years, such as Chief Santino, who's holding, holding the solar Bibles there, came to receive Christ as their saviour. And Santino went on to lead a thousand people, over a thousand people from his village to Christ. We saw miracles in our midst. If, the next slide is a, um, is a text message that I got about Chief Santino when we arrived back in New Zealand. Probably don't have time to read it, but the next slide... Uh, We saw miracles in our midst such as baby Yar, who stopped breathing for several minutes and then God brought her back to life, you know, and she made a full and complete recovery. And the next slide, baby Athea, who God healed of congenital abnormalities. We also saw massive fruit with um, people coming to Christ through Che and through our village outreaches. It, was, it has been so exciting for our team in Tonj seeing the fruit of prayer and fasting over in South Sudan. But I also don't want to give the illusion that our journey of prayer and fasting has been one big mountaintop utopia of glory. It hasn't. There have been many highs, but there have also been plenty of frustrating moments when honestly prayers felt like a struggle. For me, it's been a real encouragement reflecting on what God tells us in Genesis about our creation. He says on the one hand that we were created in God's glory, in the image of God. But on the other hand, he also reminds us that we were formed from dust. In the image of God speaks of the glory of God living inside of us. It invites us to pray and believe for the miraculous, for the impossible, to partner with God, to see his kingdom come here on earth. But formed from dust reminds us that we are not God and sometimes our prayers won't be answered. And We are weak and we are broken humans. And sometimes when we're trying to pray, we'll end up daydreaming. Or is that just me? (laughs) Sometimes when we're praying, a sinful thought might pop into our head. But I love what God says in Psalm uh, 103 verses 13 and 14. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. 
He remembers that we are only dust. So we're created in God's image and God invites us to partner with him in prayer to see the miraculous, to see his kingdom come. But we're also formed from dust. So on those days when our mind wanders or, um, you know, we're struggling, we don't have to beat ourselves up, but we can enjoy the grace and the mercy of our Father. God, that was pretty cool, eh? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so um, I thought that would be a great kind of introduction anyway to this, this topic, because I, I do want to talk about prayer um, this morning. Um, and, I mean, when you talk about prayer, I mean, most people, even if they don't go to church, they know about prayer. Um, they do it, um, even if they don't believe often. Um, you know, it's one of those things that you do when you run out of options. Um, it's when you start making deals with God. You know, if you get me out of this situation, God, then I'll devote the rest of my life to raising orphans in Africa. Um, for me as a kid, it was, Lord, if you get me out of this, this situation, Lord, I will go to youth group. Uh, and uh, you got me out of the situation. Uh, which I wasn't happy about at the time. But I was happy to get out of it, but youth group, not so much. But, hey, God moved in there. Uh, and, and it's, but uh, that's part of how we understand prayer. But as Christians, we actually say a bit more than that. We say prayer that's simply more than a get-out-of-jail-free card. Uh, we say that prayer is powerful. Um, it's a relationship that we develop, um, where we develop the ability to hear from God, and, and we allow Him to shape us and to grow us in our faith. And, and as we grow in this relationship, our prayers can have a great effect. And because prayer doesn't just transform our lives, prayer transforms the world that we're part of. Um, in James 15, sorry, in James 5, 16 to 18, the Apostle James, he writes this to the church. He says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. He says, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Now, um, when James is talking to the church, he's referencing Elijah. Elisha is like some, some kind of, he's like the rock star prophet of the Old Testament. Um, second to Moses when it comes to miracles. Or actually third, because I think Elijah had a little more. But, anyway. but he prayed, it says, and, and for three years there was no rain in Israel. But James pointed to him and said, hey, the, the Elijah, who you hold up as, 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 as the, um, this most amazing person, he's just like you and me. You know, he used to put one pant leg on at a time. Actually, back then they had robes, but you, you get the idea, don't you? Um, uh, but, he, but James goes to say, prayers are powerful. Prayers change nations. And, and when you think about it, that's quite true of history as well. Uh, throughout the years, the church has had a tremendous positive impact on most of the nations of this world. Well, actually, I would probably say all of the nations of this world. And God has been working through normal people like you and I. Um, through things like education, health, justice, social equality, human rights, all of these kind of things, churches have been in the forefront of, of positive change throughout our society. But what's really interesting is uh, throughout these change, these, a lot of these changes um, started with the spiritual renewal that began in the church. And what would you call spiritual? What would you call another name for spiritual renewal? Revival. As the church revived, then God started not to impact just the church, but the wider um, community. And these spiritual renewals, they all have one thing in common. What did they all start with? Prayer. Prayer. And I'd like to put it to you that the legacy of the church is sown in prayer. You know, what we're remembered for, what we're known for, it starts in prayer. So how we pray matters. Now, now some of you might listen to that and say, well, if, that's as, if it's as simple as that, why don't we pray more? Well, I, I guess there are a number of um, answers. I mean, John alluded to a little bit. Um, but, for example, in James 4.3, um, the Apostle James said to the church, when you pray, you pray, you're not getting what you want because you're praying with the wrong motives. Um, so that's one reason. Uh, in Matthew 21, 21, Jesus speaks of another reason we don't pray. And that's a, a lack of faith. You know, he, Jesus says a lack of faith can limit our prayers. And, and there could be a whole bunch of reasons for lack of faith. I mean, we could have a lack of faith with prayer because we're disappointed. You know, we thinking that we, we, we'd ask God for something and it didn't happen. So, hey, what's the point? You know, like God's beholden to everything that we want. 
Or, or maybe we um, don't believe that we're deserving, that God wouldn't listen to us. Like we're a bit of a failure at prayer. You know, we, I tried that once, but it, you know, just I couldn't keep it up. You know, I, I find it really interesting for us as Christians that often our approach to prayer is just to set up these unbelievably unrealistic goals as to what prayer is and then feel really guilty about not reaching them. Or, or either that or we do it once, like I've done my 40-day fast, now I can tick that box and never do it again. <laughs> See, but I want to suggest to you that if we are to be a people who um, want to grow a legacy through prayer, if we want to shape our communities and, and shape our nation and, 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 and see God work through our children and our great grandchildren and, and the like, then what we have to do in prayer has to be sustainable. We have to be able to do it now and again and again. So, so our plan as a church is to set achievable goals. So that's why the first week we've got of every term, we, we set that aside to lift high the value of prayer. Now, um, like I said earlier, some of you might be able to participate um, with us by meeting in the chapel here during the week. Um, others of you might not be able to make that, but you might be following on Facebook or text or email. And, and some of you might be able to pray for 10 minutes, and that might be, about a, that might be a record for you. Or, or for some of you might be able to do an hour a day. The point is to create a target for us that's sustainable. And then once we get that, then maybe we look to stretch it just a little. Just a little further. Uh, for me, over the past uh, three years, I've, I've started praying and fasting during prayer week. Um, and over, the, over, the, and over those, as those years have gone on, I've kind of stretched it a little bit from one day to, to two days and, and so on. Um, this year, our elders are getting into that as well. Um, but I tell you what, fasting is not my favourite part of prayer week. I can promise you that. But what I've found, a little bit like John said, is that when you dedicate time out like this, um, away from distractions like TV or unnecessary business, there's, you actually there's a certain amount of clarity that you get as your head kind of comes out of the fog. Um, and, and also there's a, lot, uh, there's a lot of passion. You start getting passionate again for Jesus. And so I would, I would just like to encourage you, if, if you're willing to try that this, this, time, this time, then I'd really encourage you to join. Uh, maybe skip a meal to pray. Uh, skip missing a, a rugby game. You know, fast for a day. You know, I'm, I'm not promising it's going to be easy. But what we'll be doing is sowing into a legacy that our church will leave for our children and our great-grandchildren, great or all those who are in our community, those who are lost and in despair. I mean, our prayers could even shape our nation. See, the legacy of our church is sown in prayer. Um, in 2 Timothy um, chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, the Apostle Paul, he uh, illustrates this importance of a church that invests in those who are yet to come. He says to his understudy, Timothy, I constantly remember you in your prayers. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. It's interesting that Timothy was one of Paul's most trusted leaders. Uh, he, was, he was young, but man, he was gifted. And Paul had handed over to him a lot of authority, placing him in charge of churches throughout Asia Minor, preaching this radical message that we aren't saved by anything we've done, that we've done, but because of the kindness of Jesus. It says, he saved us and called us into a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of his own, Jesus' own purpose and grace. See, so this was who Timothy was, but Timothy didn't come from nowhere. Timothy was the legacy of prayer. The prayers of a faithful mother, the prayers of a faithful grandmother, as well as the prayers of Paul uh, himself. And so this week, what we're wanting to um, be, what we want to pray about is what we want our legacy to look like as a church. What do we want to be? What do we want our generation, the generations that come after us to look like? Our young families, our children, our youth. Uh, we also we want to pray about how, how we see people growing in faith. Step, how do we, are we growing and stepping out in boldness in, faith, in what we believe? Are we bringing the influence of the gospel to the people around us? We're praying about how does God want us to reach out to the lost in our community? 
how we share the good news, how we um, show people the love of God, how we set people free from oppression and heal the sick and care for the poor. And then, and then the big one we want to pray about is transition. How is God going to move us from who we are right now to where he's calling us to be? To becoming the church he wants us to become. And that includes embedding uh, and, and building new leaders from within us. See, who we are now is not, this is not the stop point. We're not, we're not at prick me, I'm done stage just quite yet. God's calling us on. So what is our legacy going to be? You see, we can talk about this stuff um, and we can run new programs and all those things till the cows come home. Uh, but, uh, but in my experience, stuff starts to unfold when we start to pray. It's interesting, our last prayer week, you might remember, you might not, it was in the middle of lockdown there. Uh, and it was, we had to do Zoom prayer meetings and, and the like. Um, but interesting, just after that, Roger received a call from the gov government department saying, hey, we've seen your work with domestic abuse victims in, our commu in, in your community, and, and we want you to apply for a $28,000 grant to go towards this. Um, completely out of the blue. And so we applied, and guess what? Got the whole lot. And that's really especially encouraging for Janine and, and um, Roger and, and Rosanna, who have just been working at that stuff, slogging away in the background for ages. And we had a number of other breakthroughs over that time as well. But here's the interesting thing that I noticed, is that things start to fall into place when we start to pray. Because prayer is the way that we learn to engage with Jesus' project of saving the world. And we, when we learn to wait on him in prayer, things start to happen. So that's why prayer is important to us. And it's more important than the programs that we run. And it's more important than the people that we have. And it's even more important than putting money into a new building. Because when we pray, what we're doing is we're giving God the driving wheel to our circumstances. And we're saying, hey, God, you've got the authority to take over. See, prayer demonstrates our commitment. And, and prayer demonstrates our willingness to surrender to him. And prayer demonstrates where our faith lies. And the, and the legacy of our church is sown in our prayers. So imagine what God will do this week as we commit ourselves to pray. Imagine if what happened in South Sudan started happening here.